Welcome to Funny Because It's True, true stories told by funny people. I'm your host, Kevin McGeehan. The show is recorded live every other Tuesday at the Second City Hollywood in Los Angeles, California. Storytellers are either predetermined or chosen randomly on the night of the show, and this podcast is a mixed bag of some of my favorites. The theme of this episode is On Foreign Soil, stories of being out of your element in a strange location. Ron Babcock finds himself locked out of an Indian hostel in the middle of the night and has to devise a plan to break in. Amy McKay ends up in a hospital and gets divine protection from the advances of a lascivious male nurse who won't take no for an answer. And in part two of my story from last week, I find myself in Vienna, where my resemblance to Chuck Norris quite possibly saved me from a disastrous fate. But let's not dawdle. First up, Ron Babcock. I've I've traveled a bit, and... uh... I've always been traveling as kind of almost like a competition-based event where, you know, you want to see the coolest stuff for the least amount of money. And uh, some of the best times I've had were just kind of just happen to be standing in the right place at the right time. Call it luck. Call it whatever you want. Uh, the story I'm going to tell you tonight, though, is uh, not one of those times. This is where luck did not favor me. I was, uh, it was a little bit past midnight. Uh, I was drunk, and I was in Kerala, India. Now, most of you guys already know Kerala because... It was where they shot the beginning of uh, the Bourne supremacy, where, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> Jason Bourne's girlfriend gets shot and drowns. Now, I know Kerala because I vomited over most of it. <laughs> and I was really drunk. And I need to tell you how drunk I was because uh, it's integral to the story. So I was so drunk. How drunk were you? I was so drunk that I drunk dialed my mom. It's kind of weird, but I was really, really homesick, and your mom is like the one person you can drunk dial, because she will never get tired of you going, I love you. <laughs> I love you so much. You know, she's like, oh, it's not even my birthday. So I called her, and I stayed up really late talking to my mom, and then I get back to my hostel, right? And I'm standing outside my hostel, and uh, it's locked. Door's locked. So I'm just like, oh, God. And I start banging on the door, right? Nothing. I go to ring the doorbell. There is no doorbell because it's India, right? So I'm like, all right. And so I bang on the door again, nothing. And then I start to hear the wild dogs of Kerala barking and that getting louder and louder. Wild dogs, because it's India and they have those kind of things. And I'm freaking out. And just as I'm about to check into Hotel Shrub for the night, I look at my hostel and I realize the building next to it has a balcony. And if I can just jump up and climb up this wall, I can just grab, go like grab up, go to the top of it, then go through the mass of electrical wires, <laughs> hop onto the balcony, then climb up on top of the balcony railing and jump the five foot chasm to the uh, roof of my hostel. And you know, like when you're drunk, like you get ideas that are like, this is a good idea. <laughs> now, if I was sober, this would have been a terrible idea. But because I was drunk out, your mom drunk, this was the only idea. And so I go over to the wall, and I I jump up on it, and I I pull myself up, and the wall is stucco, so immediately my hands are like, fuck you, blood everywhere. And I I pull, but I pull myself up, I get up, and I'm like, oh, Ron won India zero. And then there is a wall of electrical wires, just a bunch of them together. And I don't really know how to get through it safely, so I just punch my hands through it and part the wires like a boxer entering the ring. It couldn't have been more dangerous if I just poured water on my dick and fucked an electrical socket. I can't believe I did that. I mean, this was these wires weren't in good American shape, okay? They were afraid, it was messed up. And I go through the wires, and then I climb onto the balcony, and then I go, and I, I get up on top of the railing, and I'm balancing, and I'm getting ready for my Jason Bourne action leap across this alleyway to get onto the roof of my hostel. And I go to jump, and halfway through the air, I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna make it. And just then, my sandal pops off my foot, and slow motion falls down to the center of the alley. Now, here's the thing. I'm really specific about my footwear. Like, I have been spending this entire trip looking for a pair of sandals because I have fallen arches and I need these things. And so I had this debate now because I was on my hostel, but these were like my only footwear. So I'm like, well, fuck it. I got to go down and get it now. 
And so I do that thing where you go to the edge and you lower yourself halfway, but you're still really high up. And I, I let go and I fall to the ground. Miraculously, I don't sprain anything. I get my sandal and then I'm like, okay, round two. Here we go. Same as the first. Wall, blood, wires. Eh, it's old hat now. I'm used to it. Get onto the balcony. Get on top of the railing. Make the jump again. Sandals stay on this time. Land on the roof. And after a good 10 minutes of fiddling with the door lock, I uh, unlock my room fall asleep and pass out. And during that night, uh, you know, when I woke up in the morning, drunk Ron had disappeared. And magically, during the night, he had transformed into hungover Ron. And while drunk Ron is known for his confidence, hungover Ron is known for not being in the mood. And so I go to check out from the hotel room, and the lady who runs the hostel, like, can't believe I made it in the room. She's like, what? Wh how, how did you get in? How did you get into your room? And I go outside and I show her and she starts hitting me and she starts yelling at me, which is exactly what my mom did when I told her the same story. <laughs> and she's hitting me and she goes, why, why didn't you wake me up? And I go, I, I tried. I knocked on the door like crazy and you didn't wake up. And she's like, well, why didn't you ring the doorbell? And I'm like, oh, silly Indian lady, there is no doorbell. <laughs> And then this is where she went outside, and I learned a very important travel lesson for any of you going to Kerala, India, that the doorbells are not on the right side of the door, but on the left. And if you don't believe me, I have the scars to prove it. Thank you. Next up, Amy McKay. You know you've made the wrong choice when the ER doctor tells you that if you hadn't come in, you could have died. Um, I was put on bl high blood pressure medication because I was taking birth control. Uh, if the ladies in the audience know if you take birth control, put your blood pressure up, so I had to go on this medication. A few days after I started taking it, I started to get very sick. I had these horrible stomach pains, and I ended up in the hospital for three days. They said it was unrelated to the medication, that I had gastroenteritis. But I thought it was kind of weird, but I trusted the doctors because they're doctors, and I'm an actor. I can only play doctors, so it didn't make any sense that they would be wrong. Um, about six months later, I saw my doctor uh, again. My doctor, who is free, because again, I'm an actor, so I don't have health insurance doctor, so this was at the free clinic. And she said, you really need to go back on this medication. And I was very wary, and I was like, oh, I don't want to. I think, I, I know you said it was gastroenteritis, but I think you're wrong, but I really, I, I couldn't fight her. She said, you need to go back on it. So I go back on this medication, and a few days later, I get very sick. My stomach is just in knots. It's the worst pain I've ever felt. It's like my guts are just at war with each other. And I get very lightheaded. And I go to the emergency room, and they say, you're in trouble. Your blood pressure is so low, low right now, we have to admit you. So I, they put me in a wheelchair, and they take me upstairs. And uh, on the route, on the way there, um, I start to get nauseated. And they give me this inverted blue cone, which I had never experienced before, but uh, it's apparently so that the, if you would puke into it, um, it doesn't splash back on you. So it looks like an upside down blue party hat. Um, so this is when I meet Chuck. Chuck is a male nurse, and as I'm dry heaving, because I hadn't eaten that morning, I'm dry heaving and vomiting green bile into this upside down blue puke party hat. He leans into me and says, you are so sexy. <laughs> and he meant it. That was the worst part of this entire story. So. I am in a haze, right? I'm in the worst pain of my entire life. I can't even, I can't even believe what's going on. And I get checked into my room and I get, I'm in the bed and Chuck is being very touchy-feely and he's touching my leg and tucking me in when he doesn't need to tuck me in. And my roommate is a woman named Bonnie Lou. <clears throat> Bonnie Lou looks like a chubbier version of Dolly Parton, and even though she's been in the hospital for weeks, um, her hair is perfect and quaffed, and her makeup is perfect, and she's in the bed next to me, and she's frantically scribbling letters on loose leaf paper. And when she fills up the front and the back, she takes the paper and she rips it into tiny pieces. And again, I'm in a daze. I'm in horrible pain. I have no what's, idea what's going on. Chuck is hitting on me. He's incredibly creepy. This woman is nuts. I don't know what's going on. Um, so I don't ask her about it at the time. That night, Chuck comes in uh, to the room to tuck me in and says, 
As he tucks me in, you are so beautiful. And Bonnie Lou says, watch out for that guy. <laughs> and in a morphine-induced haze, I fall asleep just trying to forget it all. The next day I wake up, and again, Bonnie Lou is up before me, and she's scribbling on these pieces of paper, and I have no idea what she's doing, so now I'm awake enough, and I say, what is it you're doing? And she says, um, I'm an intercessor. What is an intercessor? I communicate with God. These are prayers. I'm writing prayers to God. And I said, but then what do you do when you're, you rip them up? She says, well, he gets the message so I can rip them up and destroy them. They're for no one else's eyes. Okay, great. Chuck then comes in and has a lot of paperwork that I need to fill out for the hospital. Um, I don't really like hospitals. My grandfather was in and out of hospitals when I was a kid. For 12 years, we were always told, this is the last time you're going to see him. You need to say your goodbyes. And this went on for 12 years. So to deal with hospitals, I use humor. So when it came to the, the section of my um, paperwork that said, uh, who can we give your information out to, your medical information? I wrote my mother's name and George Clooney. And the nurse <laughs> uh, said, George Clooney? And I said, if, if he calls, by all means, <laughs> update him. <laughs> Chuck did not like this. It pissed Chuck off. Because he had competition, I have no idea. Um, so, uh, so Chuck uh, was kind of responsible for giving me information about my condition, tests that I had to be given, whatnot. And they kept pushing back these tests. And so, again, I wanted to go home so badly I didn't want to be there. And they decided that they were going to push the tests again. And he came into my room and he said, we have to push the tests again. And I just stuck out my tongue at him, very unsexily, just. And he said, you stick out that tongue again, I'm going to bite it. <laughs> and you might like it. I'm terrified at this point. I have an IV in my arm. I have a direct line into my bloodstream. I, Chuck has access to things that can go into my bloodstream that I don't think I want in my bloodstream. Um, but I felt so safe having Bonnie Lou there because it was like this angel watching over me. She had this direct line to God and regardless of your beliefs, having this woman sitting in the bed kind of being my, my guardian was an amazing, amazing feeling. The night before I was to leave, which was the next night, um, it was about four o'clock in the morning and Chuck had found out I was leaving. So in the middle of the night, <laughs> he came into my room, shook me awake, kissed me on my forehead, told me that he was sorry I was leaving but happy that I was well, and that he hoped to see me again. I uh, woke up in the morning <laughs> and was horrified, and, but he had left a piece of gauze where he had scrawled his phone number on a piece <laughs> of like surgical gauze. I threw the gauze away, I was safe. It turned out I had an anaphylactic reaction to this medication. Um, as long as I didn't take the medication, I was totally fine. And yet that entire time, I knew I was going to be okay because I had Bonnie Lou and her direct line to God. Yeah. Next up, me, Kevin McGeehan. In 2005, there was an internet sensation called Chuck Norris Facts. And I'm sure some of you have run across them. Chuck Norris does not sleep. He waits. Chuck Norris counted to infinity twice. When Chuck Norris does a push-up, he is not pushing himself up. He is pushing the earth down. <laughs> These are all just really hyperbolic factoids that make him seem like a superhuman being. Uh, there are thousands of these, but there is one that I made up specifically because it fit to me, and I found it out the hard way. I was staying in Vienna, Austria, for two weeks. My touring company had a show there. and We were basically living there for two weeks. Our only responsibility was between 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock for the show, and the rest of it was to do with as we pleased. And Vienna is absolutely a beautiful city. So many castles, museums, just steeped in history. Just a magnificent place. But there were other people on my touring company, and we all agreed that this would be more magnificent, more grand, if we could get our hands on some marijuana. But how do we get it? At the opening night party, the guy who was hosting it, who owned the restaurant we were at, uh, was very uh, nice, very uh, gregarious. So one of the other cast members asked him, so maybe how, how, how do you get uh, marijuana? 
He told us, and it was very, very simple. You walk out back, you stand at the top of the stairs behind the restaurant. You look down at the park, and you look for guys who are walking around trying to be inconspicuous. Walk up to one of them, make eye contact, and they will handle the rest. Simple. It ends up. I am with uh, the charmingly obnoxious member of my cast, and he just uh, takes charge, and he walks up to one of the guys um, and says, Weed? And the guy responds, What? (laughs) Marijuana? The guy responds, are you police? My guy responds, no, we're Americans. <laughs> that cleared up everything, and our transaction went down very, very quickly, very, very smoothly. So smoothly, in fact, we were very confident, so we turned to another guy, and we walked up to another one, and we got him to do it as well. This went so easily, and we walked back to the restaurant. We regaled the rest of our cast with our tale of adventure, uh, and we were very confident and very cocky, me specifically, because two nights later, I decided to do it again on my own. I got to the restaurant early. The rest of the cast was not there yet, so I decided I'm going to make sure I can, I'm going to get our dwindling supply back up. So I walk out back. I see uh, people being uh, non-conspicuous, and I walk up to one of them, and I say, uh, marijuana? And he said, not here. Dangerous. Follow me. Me being raised to be polite to all strangers that I encounter, <laughs> and I begin walking with him about five feet behind him, and I think we're just going around the corner, but I was wrong. We started walking down the street, and we started walking for a ways, and then another guy comes in behind us, and he's on his cell phone, and he stands behind me and a little bit to the left, making basically a triangulation pattern, so I cannot run away. Fleeing is now out of the equation. My heart's beating a little fast, and I say to the guy, our first guy, Uh, you know what? I'm just going to go. Um, I didn't know we were going to walk so far. I got friends I got to meet. And he turns to me and very sternly says, no, keep going. We're going right over there. I look over there and he's pointing to a park, which is about 20 feet away. And at this point we've walked about four minutes. Being a dumb, dumb, I follow him. And at this point, all I could think to myself is, oh my God, I am so screwed. I am such an idiot. I am in a foreign country. I have not told anyone where I'm going. I don't have cell phone service. I'm screwed. Kept going through my head so much that it eventually morphed into acceptance and then a brand new question, which is, just how screwed am I right now? (laughs) Am I get beat up, take my passport, that kind of screwed? Or am I kidnapped, sold into white slavery, rich European guy buys me and hunts me for, for sport kind of screwed? <laughs> so we get into the park, and now my heart is beating. And then guy one stops abruptly, and he walks back to me. Guy two makes an approach, and now both of them are standing about two feet away from me. And guy one looks at me and says, you got money? And I said, yeah. And I pulled out, and I gave him 20 euro. And then guy two walks over and he hands me a little baggie. And then guy one gets a little bit closer to me. And he looks at me. And I am just so freaking out. I don't know what's going to happen right now. And he looks at me and he says, you look like Chuck Norris. (laughs) And then guy two behind says, yeah, Chuck Norris. Me not knowing what to say, just say, yeah, Chuck Norris. And then we laugh. And once again, we repeat his name. The guy, too, gets out of my way, and I'm allowed to walk away. And uh, I get about a couple feet from him, and guy one yells to me, Hey, Chuck. I turn around because I'm stupidly polite. Do a kick. (laughs) So I give a cute little uh, lackluster roundhouse kick. They both erupt into laughter. I laugh with them like, oh, we're buddies now. Not a big deal. Uh, And then uh, I give them a little wave, and then I walk around the corner, and then the second I am out of sight, I sprint right back to the restaurant and just freak out a little bit because I was so very scared. So the Chuck Norris fact that I have, Chuck Norris is not stupid enough to get cornered by two Austrian drug dealers in a dark, secluded area. But the guy who looks like him certainly is. That's it. That's our show. Thanks to our storytellers, Ron Babcock and Amy McKay. 
Special thanks to Josh Callahan, Mark Warzeka, The Second City Hollywood, and the Comedy Podcast Network for producing the show. If you would ever like to see the live show, Funny Cause It's True is every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood, located on beautiful and mildly scary Hollywood Boulevard. Go to Facebook.com and like the Funny Cause It's True fan page, and you can find out show dates and upcoming themes. The next show is Tuesday, March 13th, and the theme will be Backfire. So come out, sign up right before the show, and maybe you'll get chosen to tell a true story on stage, and from there, get chosen to be on the podcast. My name is Kevin McGann. Thanks for listening. For more funny stuff for your eyes and ears, go to ComedyPodcastNetwork.com.